Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, September the 11th, 2021. It is currently 11.06 a.m. Central Time, and we are trying, I well, when I say we, well, we're, you're in you're in this with me, so you get the blame as well. So I'm going to blame you as well. We are failing. We are not doing a very good job in bringing this week's Bible study to a conclusion. I know the reality is I am having a hard time bringing this week's study to a conclusion. I really am. I'm trying my best because I, I came up with this great idea. Oh, it's Saturday. I know what we'll do. It's the end of the week. We've studied the text all week. We should all be experts in it. Let's do something I love to do at the end of a week of study or two weeks or three weeks or a month of study. Go grab some random sermons and then hit play because it's so amazing. If you've spent a week, two weeks, three weeks studying a text of scripture, it's amazing how that study can dramatically change your perception about listening to sermons about the same text of scripture because you're going to you you see things and you know the text better than well, hopefully you're you've mastered the text at that point to some level to some level. So um, I really love doing this, uh, but as usual, it takes longer than I, I, that I, that I think it will take. I always, I always come to this idea, oh, I can, I can do a sermon review in one hour. And then what am I talking about? I, I can never do that. So we went, what, an hour and 15 minutes in the last episode. So what we need to do today is we need to bring this sermon review that we are currently involved in to a conclusion so that we can bring this week's study to a conclusion. If you've been with us all week, you know that we have been studying 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 to 39. That's what we've been studying. And because it's the end of the week, we are doing a sermon review. I just picked a random sermon, went to the Edify Christian Podcast app, typed in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20, chose a random sermon, and that's what we are looking at. So far, the sermon has basically been more cross-referencing than anything else. There's a lot of things in the text they've completely ignored. The one thing they did a good job bringing up was not only in this text do we have the prophets of Baal, we also have the prophets of the grove, which for some reason this week I did not spend much time discussing. That's my fault. So I'm glad we listened to the sermon for that for that reason. Um, another interesting thing is, is when, uh, I don't know if he's going to mention this, but when you get to verse 40, when the prophets of Baal are killed, what happened to the prophet of the, the prophets of the grove? Were they just left alone? If so, why so? So, so uh, what we're going to see if they address that or deal with any of those issues. But yes, we're just we're trying to bring this sermon review to a conclusion. We ended with them, him really emphasizing the fact that, you know, Elijah mocked the prophets. And I, I talked about my dislike of the way sometimes as preachers we handle this. It's almost like we are promoting mocking people of another religion. And I talked about how it could be flipped back on us. And well, I, we, we talked a lot about that. I don't want to go review everything because I just literally finished that part just a few minutes ago. So this is part six of our week-long Bible study exercise on 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 to 39. We're concluding the week by reviewing a sermon, which hopefully you are finding to be interesting and beneficial. And we've got just, I've backed it up just a few minutes. We'll just jump back in and we'll bring this to a conclusion. And hopefully uh, it's going to help you just, it's going to reemphasize and uh, hopefully just make this text you know, even more prominent in your brain and you'll never forget it. So here we go. And he said, cry out loud or cry louder for he's a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So you might think, well, Elijah's mean. He's mocking them. That's not right. Well, you know what? God's laughing also. Psalm 2, verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And what they're doing is not only blasphemous, but it's outright silly. Are they really trusting in a God who's too busy to answer? 
or he's away on a trip, or he's sleeping. Our Bible says our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. And there's even humor in the Bible, and we have an example here. Because in verse 27, when it says uh, he's busy, what that really means is maybe he's in the bathroom. (laughs) That's what it means. He's in a celestial men's room. (laughs) But you know what? Sadly, it's about to get worse. It's about to get worse. Look at verses 28 and 29. So they cried aloud, and they cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied in the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention because there's no one there. There's no one there. <clears throat> so they've been praying for hours. Their prayers weren't enough. And it's just a couple of things here. First, he's just, you hear everybody laughing. Again, I don't find anything very humorous in this text. You got human beings, you know, 450 prophets of Baal. You've got the 400, uh, you know, prophets of the grove, which seem to just kind of be, they just seem to be there to watch. They, they don't really seem to be involved in this. So we'll just focus on the 450. And uh, these are human beings who are blinded and deceived by idolatry and false religion. Uh, they're being mocked. And then the next thing you know, they're literally causing themselves physical harm and cutting themselves and bleeding. There's nothing funny about that. Nothing to laugh at. Those are human beings suffering. This is not a fictional story. This is this is a real story. Human beings suffered. And then before it's all over, they're going to be grabbed and drugged down to the brook and slaughtered. Again, I just, the mocking, the laughing, I know I know Christians love this stuff. I've, heard, I've said in too many church services where this happens, I, I don't know why we don't ever think about this, but it, again, it just, it, just, it just bothers me, bothers me, bothers me, bothers me, bothers me, bothers me. But that's the way uh, this typically happens. So, um, and, I, and, I, and I, I guess there's another thing we just really have to discuss. We just really have to talk about this. Because it, it, in this particular historical narrative, yes, we have this contrast between a false God that cannot answer and the true God who not only answers, but answers in a dramatic way and does this miraculous miracle and demonstrates his power. And it's an amazing story. But let's just make it very, very real because we've got to, we've got, we can't, if we ignore this and, and so many preachers ignore this and the story, we got to be very careful saying, see, if you have a false God, he can't answer, but we have a real God who, ne- who neither sleeps nor slumbers and he answers. Let's make it very, let's make sure we're very, very open and honest about this. God may answer, but it doesn't mean he's always going to answer in some supernatural, powerful way. You know the story, but I have to tell it because it's, it's my experience, and, it, and I can obviously relate to this. I, I, literally, I spent an entire 24 hours all night in a church begging and pleading with God to save my mom when I was young, and she died. I prayed for my father. He died. Today is September the 11th. You know how many people pleaded and begged God that their loved one who was missing because they were in the towers that the planes crashed into on September the 11th, 2001 during a terrorist attack pleaded. And guess what? God did not miraculously deliver those people who were in those towers. They died. The people who's, who lost loved ones on the airplane that crashed into the Pentagon or the, the plane that went down when the, when the passengers tried to stop the terrorists. Yeah. Or how many people have pleaded? Uh, ple- pleaded and, and prayed to God that their young, their son or their daughter going to war in Afghanistan or Iraq would come home. And well, they came home, but not alive. I, I can go on and on and on. There's plenty of times we beg and plead God and we are met with almost a resounding silence or clearly a resounding no. So let's just make it very clear that we can mock people of other religions. You pray and your God does nothing, but I pray and well, and God may not do anything that you want as well. So we don't control God. 
And so I, it just sometimes this story is almost preached like, see, false religion, God's not going to do anything. But it's almost implied, sometimes explicitly stated, that when we pray to our God, he's going to show up and do whatever. And then when, that, when you are a Christian and you're a young Christian and you're, and you're like, oh, here's a situation. I need you, God, and he doesn't show up then sometimes that's when you begin to go, wait a minute, I don't know if this stuff is true because I don't know if we have a, do you have a theology? And this is very important. Do you have a theology that can embrace, accept, and still praise God when your child is not healed of childhood cancer? When your child does not survive being hit by a drunk driver? When your child is kidnapped and is not found alive? What, like, do you have a theology that can, when, when your cancer doesn't go away, when you lose your job, when things get worse, like, what do you, do you have a theology that can handle that? It's easy to have a theology going, well, I have a true God. They have a false God. My God can step in and send fire from heaven. And so he's going, yeah, it's easy to say that, but when it all goes wrong, that's when people begin to lose their faith. And that's because the church sets you up for that. So, yes, our God neither slumbers nor sleeps, but it doesn't mean he's going to immediately answer the way we think he will and and do what we think he's going to do and what we want him to do, because it doesn't work that way. 2,000 years of church history clearly demonstrates that. All right, there's, there's parents who get called. There's been a school shooting and they rush to the site and they wait and they wait and then they see, well, oh, oh, that parent was reunited with their kid and that parent was reunited with their kid. Oh Lord, please, 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 please. And then another bus pulls up. Okay, there's, there's, there's the kids. Okay, 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 Lord, thank you. I know my kids. Oh, and then when it's all said and done, the parent is standing there and guess what? Their kid doesn't get off a bus. They don't get re- reunited with their kid. They find out that their kid is laying in the school dead. Yeah. You've got to have a theology that can handle that. And sometimes this is just like, see, their gods don't do anything, but our God, our God does. Their false gods are useless. Our God always, always responds. Yeah. And, and not, and not always in the way you want him to respond. And it's just, yeah, sometimes we, we really, we got to really think of how we handle this uh, when we, we we preach these kinds of texts. Again, it's a historical narrative. It's descriptive. Be very careful trying to make it making it prescribe exactly what we are to do. I think there's lessons that are applicable, but we have to. Uh, well, we'll see how he handles this. Let's continue. Their prayers were not enough. Two things that I got from this here: this idea of them cutting themselves. Number one is Satan wants us to harm ourselves. He doesn't have our best interests at heart. He doesn't love us. He hates us. He hates God, and so he hates people, especially God's children. He wants us to be addicted to drugs, to cheat on our spouses, to steal and lie, to be in bondage to sin. That's his goal. That's his aim. Second thing I noticed is They're shedding their blood for their God. How completely opposite is Christianity? Our God shed his blood for us. Willingly poured it out. That's that's a very good contrast. That's that's very well done. That's very well said. They're, they're, They're shedding their blood for their God. But in Christianity, our God shed his blood for us. That is well said, well done, great contrast. That, that is awesome. That is awesome. See, again, even, and, and, and that's something always be willing to do. Even if you don't agree with the, some things in a sermon, you just always, you, what you want is to hear the word of God preached and handled correctly. And there's always something to learn. And uh, that, that is, a, I, I did not mention that contrast this week. I did not. Nobody emailed me that contrast. Nobody emailed me. Anything said anything about that this week? So, uh, again, that that's that's why sometimes you, you're listening to some s- sermons after you've done your own study to see the things that we've possibly missed. That's why we do this. We're not required to make sacrifices for our sins. Jesus is our sacrifice, and the most precious substance in the universe, the blood of God Himself, poured out for us to free us from our bondage to sin. There was no voice, no answer, 
No one paid attention. You know, God doesn't always answer our prayers when we want him to. And many times we don't get the answer we want. Many times his answer is wait. Okay, good. He's at least bringing that up, which is so important because sometimes this text is handled almost in a way that is implied that, hey, see, their God was useless. Our God will always will show up. So, and, 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 and yeah, it's true that God doesn't always answer the way we want to. Yes, it's true that God may tell us to wait. Now, again, we don't hear the wait. We just don't get what we want. So we just keep praying and praying and praying and praying. And then maybe ultimately it, it works out. But we, we uh, so I'm glad he's mentioning it. It's just, uh, I, I, we have to develop a theology of basically when it doesn't go our way. We, we have to have a theology that can embrace that. But you know he always pays attention to us. He always is watching over us. He's always with us. So the prophets of Baal have had their turn. Nothing has happened. Now it's Elijah's turn. So let's look at verses 30 to 35. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And so all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with, wa- water, pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And then he said, Do it a second time. They did it a second time. And then he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and also filled the trench with water. <coughs> so, and Elijah makes his sacrifice at 3 o'clock, which is exactly the time of the evening sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. And it says here that he repaired the altar. Now remember, Mount Carmel was a place of, of Baal worship. So this altar, which had been used to worship God, had been torn down. And so he repaired it. He built it up again. And, you know, Elijah had given these false prophets advantages. He let them go first. He let them worship at at their sacred place of worship. They could have all the prophets they want. Now Elijah gives himself handicaps, right? Dug a trench around around the altar, the trench filled with water, And he poured water on the sacrifice, not just once or twice, but three times. Wow. He's making it harder for God. No. Our God is the God of the impossible. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Keep this in mind when you pray. When you have a need and you see no way that need to be met. He's still a God of miracles. I see many right here. If you're here and you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. You're a new creation, yet you look exactly the same on the outside. And we still hear today, God doing healings, miracles of healing. Freeing people up from drugs and alcohol. Restoring relationships. The God of miracles we see in the Old Testament hasn't stopped doing them. I, I, again, these are things I struggle with. Hey, the God, the, the God of miracles in the Old Testament, he's, he's doing the same thing today. Come on, let's, let, can we just be honest? We're not seeing the same miracles done in the Old Testament today, all right? We're not seeing the plagues done in Egypt. We're not seeing food magically appear. We're not seeing water coming from a rock. And we go on and on. And on. We're not seeing fire coming down from heaven. Okay, let, let's just be careful. It's the same God because God is the same 
obviously he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It doesn't mean he's always operating in the exact same way. He is the same. His character never changes. His attributes never change. But clearly there was a time he, there, there were animal sacrifices done. And, and that, and then once in, uh, then the final sacrifice was offered in Jesus Christ. So that's not happening anymore. That's not required anymore. He, he spoke to people completely different than he does now um, because we now have the scriptures. I just, I just think, I know we want to, we want to, you know, hey, these things are happening. These things are happening. We always say these things are happening. These things are happening. And then again, sometimes when you're like, okay, well, show me, show me the proof. And then when you start investigating, you're like, well, that's not exactly the way you described it. That's not true. That's not true. Or you find out in many cases, it's straight up a hoax. I just, let's just be careful the way we state that. I read things in the Old Testament of God doing things that not... Nothing today even comes even even in the New Testament when G, like Jesus calming the storm. Where are the Christians going out stopping storms? I mean, I mean over raising the dead. There's th- that's just things that are not happening. And then they'll always hear. Well, I've heard reports that in a you know in a village somewhere in Africa, okay, it's always some place where there's no there's no there's no medical evidence. It's always some place that there's no way to really verify it. To back it up, because when pre- pre- preachers say that, and you say, "Hey, you gave this story of this divine healing. Can I have the name of the place, the location?" The t-? well, I don't have all the information. Well, you preached it like it was an absolute fact. Could you? Can we? Can we verify this? But no. Remember, in the New Testament, when when Jesus did miracles, the enemies of Jesus never questioned the veracity of the miracles. They just questioned the power in which he did the miracles, because that means the miracles were clearly demonstrated and proven to be accurate. And in and, and 2021, where everyone has a cell phone for crying out loud, these miracles should be, I mean, they should just be re- reported everywhere if it's working out that way. But it's not. Not denying God's power because he still has the same power, but God operates that power when he chooses, how he chooses. And again, I'll just give you a New Testament example. Lazarus was raised from the dead. John the Baptist didn't even get a visit while he was in prison and ended up losing his head and did not get resurrected from on earth, obviously. We believe, you know, in heaven. Obviously, he'll be in heaven. So we understand that. And then you understand what I'm talking about. You know, Lazarus was raised from the dead right there on earth. John the Baptist died. And that was the end. And that's the way it worked. Paul had a thorn of the flesh, was not healed. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Paul had, uh, Paul gives Timothy advice for his stomach issues, you know, and Paul had uh, issues with his eye. I mean, we can go eyes. We can go on and on and on. And so it doesn't always work out that way. Praise God. Let's move on. I, uh, 36 and 37. And so it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So Elijah prays and he asks for the impossible. And he says, let it be known you are God, you are Lord. Show them. Make it clear to the people so they may understand. And, And he says, at your word. See, this was God's will. This was God's plan. Elijah didn't come up with this on his own. And how we need to, to always make sure we are proceeding in the will of our Father in heaven. Whenever we endeavor to accomplish something, to make sure we have heard from the Lord what to do and when to do it. And the only way you're going to hear from God is when you open up your Bible and read it. God's not giving you out plans like that today. When people do that, oh, okay, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. And then next thing you know, it's it amazing the people sometimes who say God told me to do this and do that, how the plan can change dramatically. Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen too many times within Christianity. How about stop pretending you're hearing from God and open up your Bible and read it and follow that. And not to do anything until we've heard his still, small voice. And, and he prays here, and it says that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Turn their hearts back. Two important principles here, repentance and forgiveness. The people had sinned. They were worshiping other gods. And God desired that they would return to him. 
But first, they have to repent. They have to turn away from their sin. And if they do this, God's heart is always to forgive and restore. Like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, that God waits for us, and he forgives us, and he embraces us. He welcomes us with arms of love open wide. See, because we have a promise. We have a promise that if we ask for forgiveness, we will receive it. 1 John 1, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There needs to be repentance. So here's the climax, verses 38 and 39. Not surprisingly, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the bird sacrifice. Not only the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So God shows who's the only real true God. Consumes. He consumed the burnt sacrifice. Interesting, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. And not just the sacrifice that burned up, but the wood, stones, the ground. So there would be no doubt who's God. And oh, hallelujah, then the people believed. So that's all God's got to do then, right? Just do a mighty miracle and people will believe. Nah. Nah. Look at all the miracles God did before the Israelites. When he led them out of bondage. The ten plagues, parting of the Red Sea, manna from heaven. And yet, we don't even have to leave this book. First Kings, and we find they, they're turning away. Go to the last chapter in this book, which is chapter 22, First Kings, and look at the very last verses, <clears throat> starting with verse 51. Now, Ahab was king, right? After him came his son Ahaziah. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned two years over Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and the way of his mother and the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. So here we're, we're about roughly 20 years later, and are you kidding me? They're back to worship and bow. You know, Pastor Billy uh, did a teaching Wednesday on Revelation chapter 9, uh, the trumpet judgments. And <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 9 is the sixth trumpet judgment. And it's about uh, these creatures who are who were horses, but they had heads of lions, and they had a serpent's tail. And it says that, that they killed a third of mankind, and the rest they harmed. And listen, listen what it says. After this is happening, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. God's pouring out his judgment upon the earth. They're seeing these these fantastic things never imagined, and they're still not repenting. They didn't repent back in the Old Testament. They're not repented in the future, and it's going on today, too. What's it going to take? I'll tell you. Turning to God in faith, 
repenting of your sins. Okay, a couple of interesting things there. First of all, great job in demonstrating that miracles do not cause people to repent and to believe that even that because Israel saw all of those miracles. We talked about that this week. Now, the issue is, though, what is it going to take? It's going to retake repentance and faith. So, okay, well, where does repentance and faith come from? What is it going to take? If miracles won't convince someone to repent in faith, then why did they repent in faith? Why did they have, rep- uh, have repentance and end up with faith? If miracles doesn't bring it about, what brings it about? This gets into a very important theological discussion in regards to soteriology. My answer would be, obviously, because I hold a more reformed soteriology, is you don't get repentance and faith until you get regeneration, and regeneration is a supernatural act of God, whereby God regenerates a dead sinner, then by regenerate them, then grants them repentance and faith. It's called order, the order of salvation. In fact, we'll be talking about this a little bit tomorrow during our sermon in Romans, as we are going, going to be dealing with the doctrine of election, because we're looking at six words in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter eight, and we're down to the word of election. We're going to be doing, uh, to the elect, which de- de- deals with the doctrine of election. And we're going to be um, mentioning briefly the order of salvation. Many people believe that the way it happens is you have repentance and faith, and then that brings about regeneration. And no, I believe you have to be regenerated before you can have repentance and faith, and God has to grant you the repentance and the faith. Because it's, if miracles don't cause it, he's like, well, so, what, what, so what is needed? Repentance and faith. Okay, wonderful. Miracles doesn't cause people to have repentance and faith. What brings them to repentance and faith? Is it this them just, if a miracle cannot convince them to do so, what convinces them to do so? Is it them just convincing themselves or is salvation a supernatural work of God whereby he awakens the dead sinner and then grants them repentance and faith? I know we can go into a lot of directions with that. It's just interesting that he's like, miracles don't do it. So what's required? Repentance and faith. Let's see if he says that God is the source of repentance and faith or if we are just on our own, the source of it. Let's see what he says here. And trust him in Jesus. That's what it takes. That's God's desire. And so the last verse, so that's God. God desires you to have repentance and faith, and that's what it takes. Miracles can't cause that to happen. So what causes it to happen? Well, you just do it. You just decide, hey, I'm going to have repentance and faith. I just make the choice. I just do it. Well, wait a minute. If I'm dead in my trespasses and sins, can a dead sinner d- d- decide just to have repentance and faith? Or does it require a supernatural awakening and granting of those two things? Just... Very interesting that we're getting into a major issue of soteriology here, but we have 11 minutes left, and let's see how he's going to wrap this up. Verse here, verse 40, we read, And Elijah said to them, to the people, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Seized and executed. Wow. You think that was too harsh? This was in obedience to God's commands. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 13, we read that if anyone entices you to worship other gods, you just strike them down with the sword. See, these prophets had a choice. These prophets had a choice. They're being deceived by Satan. But they had a choice to turn to God. Again, I love the way Christians frame things. See, okay, this is not too harsh. Because God's the one who said, if anyone you know, deceives you to worship a false god, let them be struck down, let them be killed. All right. And so these prophets had a choice and they were deceived by Satan. All right. Let me make it clear. So they had a choice and they were deceived by Satan. So they chose to be deceived or was the deception put forth on them? And if it was put forth on them, let's make, by Satan, let's make, again, we just have to go all the way back and deal with this from a, a truly thoughtful position. I know when I say this, I bother Christians and it makes them so mad, but I just don't know how come we can't deal with the reality. Who created Satan? God. Who allowed Satan to come to this earth? God. Who could get rid of Satan at any moment in time? God. So God allows Satan to come, knowing he's going to deceive people, and then those people are deceived, then God calls for them to be executed. I mean, we have to deal with the how hard philosophically that is to deal with, and we're left back with a very important 
theological truth. God will have mercy in whom he will have mercy, and he will bring judgment on whom he will bring judgment. God is ultimately in charge of all of this. Well, the prophets may have, quote unquote, had a choice, but they were they were deceived by Satan. And well, you can go all the way back and you see how you ultimately end with God and God working all things according to his pleasure and his goodwill and uh, get back to the sovereignty of God. You get into a lot of theological issues here. Remember, you read, you seek God and you'll find him. And I believe if any one of those prophets, after seeing what God had done, had repented and turned to faith in Jehovah, God would have forgiven them. But they didn't. It says they were all seized. They were all executed. So steeped were they in deception. And sin. Then you might think, well, you know what? What if God did something like this today? What if there was such a dramatic demonstration of his power? Then people would believe, right? No, they wouldn't. And Jesus told us so. When he spoke about the rich man and Lazarus, remember? The rich man had it made. Lazarus lived a poor, horrible life. But he had faith in God. They died. The rich man went to Hades. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. The rich man is in torment. So he asked Abraham, Oh, Abraham, send Lazarus down to earth so he can go and warn my brothers. And this is in Luke chapter 16. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, oh, They'll, then they'll repent. Well, if God does this awesome miracle, then they'll repent. But Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And you know what, what Abraham's saying here? You have the word of God. That's all you need. You don't need to see a miracle before you. And if you're not going to believe the word, you're not going to believe a miracle. See, because all you need to do is have faith in God. And how do we get that faith? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so even if God did a miracle today, something like what he did back here, and they wouldn't believe. And I thought about that. I said, well, what if we, we just put a whole bunch of wood in this field behind us? And we publicized it. We called all the news stations. And we put out flyers. God's going to do a miracle. He's going to send fire down from heaven. And the, the TV cameraman came down, and all the people gathered, and, and we prayed, and fire came down from heaven and burnt up that wood. You think people would believe? No. No. They'd say it was some kind of fluke in the atmosphere where lightning hit this or that, and they would just blow it off. They'd say, you Christians, you, you did something. You've got a plane up there that drop fireball. They wouldn't believe <clears throat> because their hearts are hard. And so we see here in the Old Testament, we see today, we see in the future in Revelation, man is led away from worshiping God to embrace false God. And how does it happen? It's when we take our eyes off of God. God promised us You draw near to me, I will draw near to you. See, Satan dwells in darkness. Jesus is the light. Light dispels the darkness. Now, I don't know who was the first one here this morning, maybe Doug or or Tracy. When you came into the sanctuary, it's dark. You can't see anything. A couple switches, there's light. There's no darkness. Jesus is the light, and light overcomes darkness. End of story. 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we're in the light, darkness can't touch us. That's why the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. Not might, 
Not probably, he will flee. He has to. He can't stand the light. And Jesus is a light. And because we have Jesus Christ in us, we're light. <clears throat> but the devil's not going to give up. He's always going to be trying. The Bible says he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. And our hearts, and you know our hearts, the Bible says they're wicked, we're easily led astray. We need Jesus. He's our defense against Satan. He's the one who gives us the victory over Satan. Complete, total victory. Victory over sin. Victory over death. Victory over hell. But what's it take to be assured of this victory? One that's going to last for all eternity. Repent of your sins. Believe Jesus, who he said he is, the Son of God, the promised Savior. Put your complete faith and trust in him. And you can do that today. If you're here or if you're listening online, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you can do it. Why wait? Well, I know what you may be thinking. I've got time. How do you know? Has God told you when your last day here on earth is going to be? No one knows. And life is short. That's why the Bible says today is the day of your salvation. Now, I don't know this for sure. We were talking about this the other day. <clears throat> you think about hell. I know what the Bible says about hell. There's weeping, gnashing of teeth, there's fire, there's torment. These things you know. But I'm thinking, what if, for those people that are in hell, God brings to their remembrance all the times they heard the gospel? The regret. You, I can't imagine. Oh, I was in that church that time. That guy preached about Jesus. Oh, my neighbor told me about Jesus. Oh, that. And it's too late. It's the most horrible thing. It's too late. That's why <clears throat> you need to make that decision now. You really don't know. We like to say, oh, I'm going to be alive. Next week I'm doing this. Next month I'm doing this. And it's okay to say that, but do you really absolutely know? No. <clears throat> do people die suddenly? Every day. Every day there's probably thousands of people that woke up and did not think, oh, today's my last day on earth. We don't, we don't think that way. And that's why. You don't want to put this off. Because when you die, God gives us every opportunity until that time comes. After you die... You've had your chances. <clears throat> so, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I would like to ask you, please, pray with me. Okay, and that, so that's the end of the ex, exege, exege, <laughs> exegesis of the text. You can draw your own conclusions on how well you think the text was exegeted. All the different tenses of saying it. Uh, but that's his exegetical study of the text, if we call that. that it's more of a... I, it's just interesting because if you think the thesis of the sermon was idolatry, 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 idolatry. And it's now turned into more the application is get saved today. Well, what about driving home... What idolatry do you need to repent of, Christians? What false gods have you uh, erected in your life? What false gods are you dedicating yourself to? That should have been the, the emphasis because that's how he started. But what the thesis of the sermon was is not the application. It's really weird. It kind of took a completely different turn. Satan's out to get us. Uh, but he, he, he stopped talking about idolatry and false religion. And he started talking about salvation. I don't really, so I don't really know exactly what the thesis of the sermon was. I thought the thesis of the sermon was since he spent all of that time in the intro before he even got to the text was, hey, we've got idolatry in, in our life. That's what we need to look at. So a couple of things. One, he did not address the fact he quoted from Deuteronomy that if anyone is basically, you know, leads you to a false god, they should be struck down. You've got the 450 of the prophets of Baal, the 400 of the prophets of the grove, but the prophets of the grove don't appear to be struck down. So why not? Why weren't they killed? Did they repent? Well, like what? 
So like that, that's, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. Um, he didn't really deal with the fact that Elijah was like, I'm the only one. Um, he, he didn't deal with that. Um, or can, and all the cross references, he, he, it's just interesting. A lot of the cross references he made, he didn't cross reference things that would have been more like, it would have been more important to look at all, all the times that Elijah tell, he tells God twice that I'm the only one. Like, um, and then God tells him that he's not like, why, why wouldn't you cross reference that? That would be more relatable to the text, but he just bring brings in other cross references that don't have anything to do with the text, which was an interesting, uh, choice. So I guess I will end with this. This, this is a, probably how I want to end this week. If you were to write out like a paragraph or, or a sentence or a couple of bullet bullet points on what is the major lessons to be learned from this text, what would you, what would you take from it? What would be some lessons you think that just jumps out of this text that we've spent all week looking at? Do you think it's Elijah saying, I'm the only one? Do you think that's a major lesson here? How long are you going to halt between two opinions? Do you think that's a major lesson to be learned? Do you see the futility of idolatry as a lesson to be learned? Is this a warning about idolatry to you and to me? Is it uh, like, what, what do you think some of the major lessons that jump out from the text? Make sure the lessons are derived from the text. Make sure we are not, again, lessons and application. We just got to make sure we're not prescribing. In other words, the text can teach you a lesson and there can be an application without saying, hey, everything in this text is prescribing how I'm to act. I'm going to go out and mock people. I'm going to go out and kill people. Clearly not. So we know that that most of this text is descriptive, but in its describing of this historical narrative, what lessons can we learn from it and can and can think about? It? I really want you to just end this week with trying to come up with those lessons. I apologize it took all of this time to work through this, but again, there were some things he pointed out there that I, I completely overlooked, the prophets of the grove. I My brain was so focused on the 450 and what's going to happen to them at the end and uh, that I completely ignore the others. So uh, that's another reason it was good listening to the text because I missed some things. Um, There's a couple of things he pointed out that I thought were very good. Um, I thought the contrast between these prophets cutting and bleeding, they're bleeding for their God, that the New Testament has our God bleeding for us. I think that's a very interesting contrast that I completely overlooked this week. So that was a good thing. Um, But then there was a lot of things just from from the text itself. He didn't really, a lot of issues in the text he did not deal with, but uh, there you have it. There's an example of a sermon on 1 Kings 18, 20 to 40. Um, 20 to 39 was our text this week, but there you have it. If you have any concluding thoughts from this week's study, let me know. You can email me newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and you can go ahead now after you've done a little bit of that work um, you can go ahead if you would like. I'm just going to go to the curriculum really quick. Um, if I can find the ministry grid. Here we go. Where is it? It's right there. I'm going to open up ministry grid. Give me one second. Remember, if you would like to uh, subscribe so that you can well subscribe, all you have to do is register. We're, we're doing this subscription. You get free access to uh, the curriculum. All you have to go is to theologycentral.net. Go to the blog section. Look for the article for a daily discipleship guide follow the link. You can register and you'll have access to all of the curriculum. And it's supposed to supplement the, uh, the week's study. So please use it. I'm going to log in really quick and pull up the curriculum for this upcoming week. Give me one second. Here we go. All right. This week, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19, Basically, verses 1 through 18. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. Uh, you have a- available to you the adult personal study guide, the adult leader guide, the daily discipleship guide, the daily uh, leadership guide. You also have a podcast in there from the people who put. Pr- pr- produce the curriculum. So you have all of that available to you. The main thing you need to do is start reading 1 Kings 19, 1 through 18, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Create an outline and uh, we'll start talking about it probably tomorrow. All right, there you have it. Hopefully, hopefully that was helpful and beneficial. Um, again, I I love doing that. It it, it it just reinforces things I've already studied this week. It made me see some things that I overlooked, and uh, that's always beneficial. And uh, I would just I would love to see what you got from the study this week. Let me know what you what you learned. What what did you struggle with? What was beneficial? What was convicting? 
whatever, let me know. And uh, you can email me everything, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, everyone have a great Saturday. God bless.